again, welcome to MBS History, and this episode is going to be a short tutorial video and a full playthrough of the Battle of Arda game made through the AAA engine, aka Axes and Allies Lord of the Rings. Before I start this video, I'd just like to note this is a Axes and Allies game. Though it's been so dramatically altered and changed, the rules for instance are completely different that it's almost it's basically it's a game of its own so if you haven't played axis and allies don't worry this game is so dramatically different that it wouldn't matter in the first place um, if you'd like to skip just to the playthrough i believe i'll put a link up here click on that time zone and uh if you'd like to know where to download this game because it's free to play where to download the maps and how to do everything from point a to B, as far as Axis and Allies is concerned, you can click on this card over here. This is my tutorial on how to play Axis and Allies in general. Without further ado, let's go through the tutorial of this game. Uh, as you can see in the top right hand corner, my display, this is the map which shows all the different factions in this. It's based in the um, Third Age, although it's kind of melding different time periods a little bit. Uh, bright colors for each faction. It's really well not, like, I, I can't say enough the fans who made this game, they did a fantastic job it's beautiful and so much work was put into it you can tell so i'm going to go through the factions the way the uh the game lists them so uh, first off we have purple saruman isengard over here angma up top no witch king unit unfortunately but there are dragons angmar is that dark reddish color mordor black over here of course no you uh do not get Sauron, but you do get a lot of unique units. Uh, Arnor, this ugly yellowish color, Riverside Angmar. Gondor, the offset kind of white blue tint color over here. Northmen, this darker yellow color. As you can see, there's uh, two groupings, two clusters. Lorien, uh, just over here, this kind of teal looking color. Orcs just beside them, the red, orcs of Gundabad, mind you, but they just call them orcs for this. Bright red, rune, uh, bright pink, unique choice of color for rune. Uh, the high elves are the uh, dark blue, so you have Rivendell over here, little cluster group over here you start with, and then on to the left of the map, really, really distant. Uh, woodland realm elves, this uh, real dark green color. Harad, of course the brown, all the way to the south, and yes, you do get Oliphants, those are very fun. Dol Guldor, this uh, slightly, I guess, lighter black color. The Free Folk being the hobbits and such, this green color, kind of tealy. Uh, there's only one Dwarves faction, and they are the orange, so they are displaced a little bit over here to the right, here, Durance Halls, and all the way to the left, Durance Halls, and the Blue Mountain. So, like I said, this is an Axis and Allies game, so it does follow the general Axis and Allies rules. For those of you who played Axis and Allies, the major differences are Oh boy, where to start? There's no blitzing. Uh, it completely alters how the game works. Uh, actually, the best way to go about this is if you open up your game and you're looking for help, look at the game notes. So I'll open this up here. So what makes this game so much different? Uh, there is a free-for-all option, so if you'd like to play a uh, conquer Middle Earth kind of scenario, you can. Although I have to admit this game is not balanced, as it is because it is originally set as good versus evil, so half the units you see are funding the other half of the units. Uh, it's quite in the favor of the good guys. It's really hard to win as the bad guys, but you can play free-for-all. All units blitz. This dramatically changes the entire game. Uh, the fact that you can't blitz is a core function of this game, and I recommend that you play with that on. Uh, mountain restrictions. Uh, so if I go back to the game itself, all these terrains are different. As you can see here, these rough patches are mountains. Certain units that can cross mounts can other units that can't cross mounts can this is a significant thing for this game also there is uh, certain terrains that units favor it gives them bonuses uh there's also fortresses i'll talk about that in a bit it's a key aspect of this game 
victory you don't get all the capital it's just like accidentally it's, it's, it's like risk take over as much uh, area as you can uh, this is not important uh, there's of course land air and water based units it's very limited in this game okay so okay we're going to talk about this just a little bit uh i don't want to go through all this it'll take an hour but there uh, unlike regular axes and allies this game has a absolute there's too much stuff going on there is all sorts of different unique abilities per unit types there's different units for every single faction and that's ridiculous when you think about it so just to go briefly into it if you look at support types range gives power to allied melee units while attacking armor takes away power from enemy units shield i'm not going to list all of them but basically all the units have different abilities and they also have terrain preferences so as you can see open cavalry likes this wilderness creatures get bonuses if they have the thing that says wilderness on it woodlands dwarves prefer rocky areas etc etc it's uh there's a lot of things to be listed here i'll simply go into the units themselves because it's it explains it more so so if you go over here back to the help menu you go to units i can't go through all the units because it'll it'll, it'll take an hour uh, this is Saruman's forces, so as you can see here, prefers wilderness. Dunedain Wildman. He's a mountaineer, means that he can cross over the mountains. So if you look over here at Saruman, surrounded by mountains. No one else can pass these mountains except for those wildmen. Going to other units, you have a wizard, for instance. A wizard has a ton of different abilities, that's why he's $20 and so expensive. He gives a leadership power a bonus. When he's on the attack, he gives duel bonuses. A duel means that he, if there is two units that have the ability to duel, which there's not many, there's the wizard and let's say a Nazgul. If they're in combat, they fight each other uh, before everyone else fights and it's, it's, it's its own thing. This gets so much more complicated as there's so many different units. So I'm only gonna give you a brief overview just to look at some of it. Uh, so like, let's say I was looking at Agmar. Agmar has dragons. Dragons have 3 HP, so if you're playing Axis and Allies, you're already like, oh my god, you have to kill this thing three times. They have all sorts of bonuses. It's an extremely expensive unit. have to use them sparingly. You get two of them at the beginning, and to be honest, it doesn't make up for the fact that Agmar is very weak. It's very hard to uh, survive as Agmar. Uh, here, let's look at a core aspect of the game. So uh, let's take, for instance... Over here is a great one, uh, fortifications. So let's go over our units again. I'll go over to the dwarves. I think they're the last one. Yeah. Okay, so you have a fortress. Must, much like other games of Axis and Allies, it um, it's a zero with a certain amount of defense, except for the, <clears throat> the only thing about this game is in order to attack uh, structures such as ancient towers, fortresses, ancient walls, or whatever that faction has, you usually need siege weapons. So uh, let's say the dwarves here trebuchets it does a certain amount of damage for siege so you have to the keyword is siege here certain units can do things in sieges certain units cannot if your units cannot do a siege bonus these fortresses obliterate you you basically the only way to describe it is you would need 20 times the amount of units to take down a wall it's it breaks this game in a lot of ways but basically some factions do not have the ability to siege so whether you like it or not, let's say uh, the elves over here, they don't really have much to siege with. It's a nightmare to try and take down the orcs' uh, cities. You end up in a siege. You surround, taking all the money from the areas you can, and the enemy in question has to withhold themselves within their walls until you can get one of your allies to come over and break those walls down. It's a core aspect of this game, so this game can be really thought of as a medieval game. The whole thing is sieging, and that becomes extremely apparent when you're fighting here as Gondor and Mordor, because you're just trebucheting each other at this point. Um, anything else that's extremely important before I get into the game? Uh, there's so many units, it's, it's absolutely, it's, it's crazy to even talk about. Let's say, uh, let's go through a, a brief amount. Uh, Saruman, you've seen. So there's Nazguls who are duelers. They have all sorts of different abilities. They terrify the other units. They duel, as I said. They offer support. Dragons are a siege monster of its own. Only Agmar gets them, mind you. Um, 
Mordor gets a uh, winged Nazgul, unlike dragons, they only have 2 HP. They do duel, so they're duelers, and I don't think they siege. No, they don't siege. Uh, because Mordor has trebuchets. Oh, uh, of course, I'll talk about. So there is air units, land units, and um, very few navy units. This game has two types of naval units. You have small boats um, over here that only can traverse the rivers. You can see uh, it's a slight different coloration. So you can move in these small rivers, and then other boats, like the Corsairs of the Harad, can go through the ocean. So the Harad can actually come all the way up here eventually and attack this, which is something you actually do. Uh, and boats, um, just like Axe and Allies, attack each other. They all transport. Uh, let me look. So you can see here the black ship is the Harad special ship. It has 2 HP transports for everything has a transport cost of one so it's not very complicated to transport units and uh, it's pretty self-explanatory if you played Axis and Allies before. Um, other features of this game. The blitzing thing, okay, as I was trying to explain before. The reason why this is so important if you played Axis and Allies to blitz, for those of you who haven't, means if I was attacking this territory um, and there was nobody on this territory but it owned, it was owned by the other player, I could simply take it and then go attack another territory. Because if my units have more than one movement, meaning they can move one that more than one territory, I could te technically take two territories in one turn. Uh, this isn't possible in this game without the blitzing. You could click it on, but... I argue it breaks the game. So basically the way the game works, if you're playing the good guys for instance, and let's say you're over here, you're Arnor and the free folk, you end up having to play using your allies. So you'll take one turn so that your allies in that next round will take the next and you'll build upon that. So the only way to really progress in this game is to work with your allies. And that's strongly the case for the good guys. For the bad guys, you're really on the defensive in this game. And that's why I'm saying, again, it's really unbalanced. Run basically, is the only one who can aggressively expand. For Mordor, you're gambling if you try and uh, expand at all, because Gondor could just beat you if you do that. So you kind of want to be on the defensive. And Saruman, despite how it looks over here, he gets completely obliterated, as does Angmar. Angmar can't defend itself, and it's completely isolated. I think I've said quite a lot, so I'll just kind of go through a full playthrough, and I have to do this really quick, because I know this video is going to run like 40 minutes, I'm saying that right now, I think it's going to run like 40 minutes, ugh, it's too long for these things. So uh, this is the beginning of the game, and the way I'm going to do this playthrough is I'm going to just go through the rounds here, as you can see it took me 19 rounds to uh, fully complete the game, which I think is a good average, and that takes a, a long amount of time, I'd say it was a good 8 hours. So without further ado, this will be what a playthrough of the game looks like, starting now. So, round one. As you can see, everything, it looks the way it does. Let me click on round two. So as you can see, I was playing as the bad guys in this, and uh, Mordor, I expanded up a little bit. Rune, you know, expands quite heavily. I even went up the river over here. I got closer to uh, the halls of Gore. Don't know if I said that right. Angmar, I expand a little bit, although I'm already I'm going to get crushed a bit. The uh, the orcs, I expand heavily. Took this area. Saruman, I try to take some more key areas, and I'm just overly expanding. Round three. Angmar is getting pushed in because it is weak and has no ability, no allies to help it. Losing all this territory while Ruin is surrounding over here. This place because I'm going to siege it. As you can see, I'm bringing up my trebuchets. Key element to this game. Same goes here. I'm bringing up my trebuchets because I am trying to attack this area with Mordor. Harad, I successfully sailed and took with siege weapons some of these key areas, taking the underbelly of Gondor, which is surprising. And it's a game changer. Uh, not much more to say. Uh, the orcs are completely obliterating Lorien. And even the high elves are getting pretty hurt. So round four. Uh, 
pushing in slightly more so. Even Harad is now coming up to help, and the Harad are expanding within the Gondor. I don't know if I mentioned you get a lot of money for these uh, victory cities, capital cities. Uh, Angmar is going to basically be holding on for dear life for the rest of this time. Haven't taken this, but I am sieging. I'm surrounding it. I'm getting my trebuchets. Not much more to say. Round five. Ruin now has finally taken this down with a lot of losses because it is a nightmare sieging anywhere. You just get destroyed. So Ruin is heavily expanding. Agmar is barely holding on with those two dragons defending everything. Uh, the orcs have completely obliterated Lorien. They're basically out of the game. Don't know how Saruman got up there. Uh, Saruman is, you know, defending itself. Rohan over here is like... Uh, not doing so so much. I even mentioned Rohan in my video. Oh boy, I forgot Rohan. They were the last ones. That's really stupid of me. I'm, not, I'm so sorry about that. I'll probably make a note in the editing. And Gondor is expanding closer and closer. Uh, Mordor is expanding more and more into Gondor. Northmen are pushing a little bit. My Dolgodor forces are trying to expand up north, taking down the Woodland Realm. Let's go round six. Ruin is just pushing more to the left now, getting my siege weapons to go into there. Just not doing too much here. Dolkuldor is sitting over here, wants to take uh, the Northmen territory. Orcs are just running amok everywhere, taking all that precious money. Gondor is completely s screwed at this point, because Harad has just taken everything from it, and they're consolidating their forces here while Mordor will crush them, even taking some of that. Uh, the rest of the world, as you can see, the good forces are holding pretty well. Round 7, not too much happened, still pushing with Rune. Oh, I uh, took Bjorn's Halls with Dol Guldur. Orcs, doing orc things, trying to probably siege over here. You can see I have a Balrog. Yeah, you get Balrogs. It's, it's a hell of a unit. I can hold my cursor over it, you can see. Duels has a terror ability, leadership ability. 2 HP, it's a nightmare. And yeah, Gondor's falling apart. Let's go to round 8. Round 8 took East off Gilead. They're consolidating their forces, but it doesn't mean anything. Harad is just completely taking Gondor. Uh, Saruman got absolutely run in by Rohan, of course. Free folk are even coming in to hurt Saruman's forces. The orcs are. Orcs took Riven... Rivendell. But. They're going to get in trouble soon. Uh, what else is there? Dol Guldur is, uh, is doing pretty good now. Making good work of these guys. And Agmar is almost dead. Round 9. Ruin now took most of the dwarfs areas here. Just this one is surviving. Woodland Realm is almost dead. Rohan is... <laughs> Tables are turning on Rohan, that's for sure not. Harad's coming into it. Saruman's forces are uh, holding all right. Uh, the rest of Osgiliath is now under Mordor's control. Orcs are just doing so well. Uh, what else is there to say? That's not too, too much. We'll go to round 10. Took the rest of that. Still pushing. Dolkuldor is holding a good amount of territory. Uh, Mordor is at the gates of Minas Tirith, and so is the Harad. And the orcs have taken over this territory to push out the free folk who are so annoying in this game. Very weak units, but they get a lot of them. Uh, Arnor is doing very well. Okay, let's go to round 11. Gondor is no more. The Age of Men is over. And now they will slowly come over here to finish off Rohan, who only has very few forces. Saruman is doing much better now. Yes, yes, yes. Rune. Okay, let's go round 12. It's kind of like the cleanup stage, because I've basically won the game at this point. You can see the map is dramatically altered. The free folk are getting hit up by Saruman and the orcs. Dolkuldor has completely come in here. Northern men are not doing too well. Angmar is holding on. It survived. Rune is an absolute tyrant. The strongest right now. Round 13. Rune is just pushing more and more to the left. Dol Guldor is helping. The orcs are also pushing to the left. We're taking more of the free folk territories. Harad is just 
enormous and as, as you can see I have all these C units here that I have been building up in the Gondor area because I plan on I think I was attacking over here that'll come in later Arnor is barely holding on with the free folk against the onslaught that will come round 14 not much more to say so many of these units are so far away they can't help over here to the left but you can see I'm slowly driving the Oliphants from Hyrad and the Nazgul and the Trolls of Mordor is slowly coming up here they're gonna start wrecking Hobbiton and such uh, Angmar is reclaiming its lost territory. Ruin is going to just siege the hell out of everything. Uh, the High Elves have lost their territories all over here. Round 15. Wow, a lot happened. Ruin pushed heavily. We're now going to be hitting up the Kingdom of Arnor. Um, Mordor is, you know, slogging it. And those boats landed over here just to get more units for Harad. Dolkul Dor is just, you know, helping the over the overflow over here. Round 16. High Elves somehow show up here. Uh, Rune is helping. Uh, Dolkul Dor took one of the capitals of Arnor, Amunsul. Uh, the Free Folk are about to get sieged by just the forces of evil, as it were. And Harad's fleet is coming over here to mess with the High Elves. Uh, anything else to mention? No, not too much. Round 17, Harad has landed. Mithlond has been taken, so... All the fonts are just going to run wild all over this area, as it were. And they are also attacking from here. Saruman has taken all of this. Uh... Vogel doors attacking, siege weapons are being lit up to uh, attack Bornost of Arnor. Not much more to say. Round 18. Just so many different colors. So many areas have been taken over. There's like a pocket over here of the Free Folk and over here that are still standing. Arnor has its last little kingdom over here. And Harad is dramatically expanding, of course. Uh, the Dwarves' last kingdom is over here. And we'll just uh, last round, of course, it's the end. Everything has been taken over, though I just noticed that the free folk... Oh, I left Hobbiton. I mean, I already won the game, but I had to leave Hobbiton at least, you know, for the poor guys. And I left uh, this one little kingdom of Arnor. But that's the game in a nutshell. And um, it can go any way. I mean, you, you can play as the good faction, or you can play as the evil faction uh, like I said before it's very unbalanced for the good side you can even look here at the points at the beginning of the game that's uh, it's a huge disparity yes the bad guys get a lot more units at the beginning but they, they just don't make up for it because there's all these this neutral territory controlled by white that you just freely take as the good guys whereas the bad guys get a very small little chunk over here it just doesn't make up for it there's the longer the game goes on, the more in favor it is for the good guys. As it is in Axis and Allies, mind you, for the Allies. Uh, there's not too much more to say about this game. I really hope you enjoy this. I uh, found that a lot of people are surprised by these videos because they never heard about AAA. So again, just promoting the community. I hope more people download this engine. It's free. There's hundreds of maps. You, there's a Game of Thrones map if you're into that. Star Wars map. Napoleon, World War One, anything you can actually think of. There's a crazy civilization map I just came across where it goes through different stages of humanity. That one looks awesome. Uh, there's not much more to say if you've watched it this entire time. Thank you so much. And uh, until next time, this has been NBS History. Hello, Paul.